Good afternoon. I'm Lauren Clementino, a member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in watch and listen only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on live transcript and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Diana Flores will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email and being shown on the screen. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. This is estimated to take the time to complete the survey is estimated at two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona such as today's webinar. Please visit azla.org for additional information. The Professional Development Committee wants you. If you have expertise in library science that you think would be helpful to other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link in your follow-up email. I want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On March 14th, join us for LGBTQ plus outreach and community building with Felicia Fiedler. Has your library considered local LGBTQ plus population? Do you know what resources exist for your local LGBTQ plus community? Where do you even begin? This presentation is designed to help library staff expand their reach to those community members that could use a helping hand. Felicia explains how they overcome existing communication barriers within their community and created regular LGBTQ programming. Attendees will leave with programming examples, recommended strategies, resources, and more. Registration for this webinar is posted to the Arizona State Library's events calendar, the AZLA calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. I would like to thank you all for attending today. Please welcome Erin Krause Riley for her presentation, The Art of Saying No, The Positive Aspects of a Negative Answer. Welcome Erin. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Um, I mean, my webinar. I appreciate everybody joining me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen and see if I can do this correctly. And yes, and yes, and almost. All right. As you can see, I'm not a professional webinar offerer, so I'm going to do my best here today. Um, I developed this webinar for um, the Scottsdale Public Library's All Staff um, Conference this year. It's actually in October, so technically last year, but it's this fiscal year. So um, we had a lot of discussion around what um, our staff needed uh, with regard to customer service, and one of the big things that kept coming up 
coming up was talking about de-escalation, how to talk to people who are unhappy with something, what to be able to say to them. And I said, well, that's really easy. You just say no. And everybody looked at me and said, well, it's not that easy for everybody. So let me describe to you. I do have a little bit of um, background in saying no. Um, some of it is because of the work I've done that has nothing to do with working in the library. First of all, I spent many, many years toiling in the retail sales area, which meant I ran a store or worked behind a counter or had to authorize things um, in a retail setting. And there's plenty of chances uh, to say no in that setting, such as, um, no, ma'am, we can't return that pair of pants for you. They've clearly been worn. And, and this is a, a sangria stain right here. Uh, so no, we can't give you full price for that. Um, I also worked in... Uh, a range of bookstores and drugstores and all kinds of settings where um, I would often be called on to say no. Um, another aspect of my no background is uh, I did go to law school and a lot of that, while much of the time you're being um, shown how to make persuasive arguments to get people to say yes, much of the time you're being taught how to tell people no because they need to follow the rules, the law, regulations, etc. So there's a lot there. You're also under the constraint you're being told no regularly unless you know your rules very well, such as if you don't file your briefs on time, the judge can say, no, I won't hear your case anymore. Your client is out of luck. So we really try not to have that happen. Um, and finally, uh, I'm a mom of four and anybody who has even one child knows that if you are a mom, you do spend a lot of time saying no. So um, that's really my credibility there. Um, and I just have spent a lot of time in customer service and maybe I'm just um, somebody, even though I really try to be positive, um, I, I can see the value of sometimes having to be negative. So let's get going. Um, the next slide shows um, someone who has clearly been at the desk for a while, been at a service point, feels very frustrated, maybe has had quite a few customers in a row who've um, made life very difficult and, and really looks under stress. And a lot of the time, this is how we greet people. We are in this position where we've just, we, we're on our last nerve. So the first thing that I wanna say to you all about the importance of being able to say no to people is that you wanna be in the position to say yes to people as often as possible. That is gonna be the biggest opportunity you have to lower your stress levels, make sure that you um, are going to be able to give good customer service, stay in a positive frame of mind. Um, and often you'll find that you can say yes a good percent of the time. And the best way to know how to say yes is to know um, all of the rules and the little ins and outs of everything that you do at your desks every day. So the big positive elements about saying no start out to be say yes as often as you can. And then also say yes, because you know the rules. Um, another thing that you need to be able to be prepared to say before you get right into that no element is you need to be able to take a minute, take a breath and say, I'm not sure, I'll find out. Sometimes um, just being able to step back, take a look at your rules, make sure you know what you're talking about um, is really helpful. And giving yourself that break for a minute, taking a step back, giving a patron who might be getting a little hot under the collar, that's also very helpful. Um, that's a really nice minute to take a break. So before we even get to say no, we're saying yes, because we know what rules we have. We know um, how we can best use them to serve our patrons. We know we can say something like, I might not be able to do that for you, but here's what I can do. That's an important piece. And then the next thing is to equivocate a little bit and say, you know what? I will have to find out. I am not the expert on that. Let me go check. Um, that always gives you that break. It gives you a chance to think and um, it gives your patron a chance to calm down a little bit too if there's anything that's already kind of escalated. Uh, let's see. So back here again to talking about saying yes, this is important again. Um, and I hate to repeat myself, but the more that you can tell people yes, uh, the better off you'll be. And then there's maybe, which we've gone over as well. What you wanna be careful about with maybe is you don't wanna have your next uh, colleague who's gonna come and deal with this patron um, feel like they've been um, given a little bit of a, um, 
a problem by you because they're going to be dealing with the downstream consequences of you not nipping some situation in the bud. So if you are concerned about making a patron upset and you feel like you just want to be done with the interaction, you can't really come to a conclusion. So you say, maybe we can do something for you. Come back to the desk in a little while and we'll see what we can do. And the thing about that is you may not be the next person at the desk. Um, and the person that is at the desk will have to deal with your decision to not um, complete the transaction you are having with the customer. Um, we've all been in that position, I'm sure, if you've worked at a service desk in anywhere for any length of time, you've been the person to come up and have um, someone who walks up to you with purpose say, I was just talking to the person who was standing here. She's tall. She had dark hair. She wears glasses. I think her name was Erin. And she told me that if I came back to the desk, you would let me rent um, three study rooms for the whole day each and then bring in 22 computers so that I could use them in those three study rooms. She said, uh, maybe, and she was going to find out. And if I came back, I would be able to do it. Well, that's pretty extreme, but I think everybody can understand the difficulty when you decide um, that you are meeting somebody who's been told that they might be able to get around a rule, even though you know that that's not going to be possible. So one of the things we want to be sure of, and one of the best reasons to say no, is that you want to make sure that you are not putting someone else in a difficult position. Um, that's a very positive element about that might help you feel like you're able to finish up a transaction in a negative way for the patron, but in a positive way for your colleagues. So the person who wants to rent the three study rooms and bring 22 computers, you have ammunition about what to tell them because you know your rules. You know that person's only allowed to rent one study room at a time. You know that they're not allowed to bring in a lot of extra technical devices because our Wi-Fi load can't handle it. So you knowing those things are able to craft an answer that sounds sensible and pleasant and is about the rules and not about the patron and not about you. And it's a lot better than saying, um, maybe I'll see, um, come back in a little while and we'll try to figure it out. Basically, you just don't want to be that coworker who's left your partner hanging. Uh, nobody likes that. So now we're getting down to the nitty gritty. How about no? How do you say no when we are so often given the message that the customer is always right, the patron should, we should go out of our way to do everything we can for a patron. And yet we all know that we have rules and we know that we have the rules for a good reason. We know we can't allow people to check out a hundred books and keep them for six months. We can't allow uh, people to have 22 um, ILL requests because we know that that will overwhelm the system. We know the reasons that our rules are put into place. And if you don't know now, you've been told by me multiple times already in this webinar that you need to let people know um, what the basis of the rule is. A lot of people feel much more comfortable if you have to say no, if you can give them a little bit of an explanation. Now, sometimes we know that no is a complete sentence and a full answer. And a lot of times, even though you're a little nervous to try it, if you let the patron ask what they want, and then you say, no, wait a minute, a lot of times the patron will start to kind of back off and rethink what their demand was. Um, now that doesn't always happen, certainly. We know there are a lot of people who come into a public place or up to a public desk or into a store for that matter, and they're kind of spoiling for a fight. And there's not a lot that you can really do to undo that person's bad attitude. But if you're, again, armed with the facts and you know um, what you're talking about, you know the reasons that your rules are in place, you should feel comfortable saying no. Um, you don't even have to apologize, though a lot of times people feel more comfortable being able to say, I'm sorry, no, we're not going to be able to do that for you. The next best piece is if you know your rules and you know what can be done for the patron, no, I can let you borrow 30 books for three weeks and then those books will automatically renew as long as nobody else is looking for them. That already sounds a lot better than just a flat no and it already gives the patrons some of what they want. So that's another way to think about it. Sometimes saying no is just putting some limits on a yes and that's another thing to think about. Yeses have boundaries and sometimes that's what no sounds like. 
The other thing about um, being able to stop and again, take a breath, say no, wait for the patron to, you know, kind of launch the next volley. Sometimes they'll come back with something that's a lot more reasonable. And sometimes just they'll be a little bit surprised and a little bit taken aback. Um, but again, you need to remember when you're there and kind of in the face of somebody who isn't happy and isn't going to get what they want because they're asking for something that goes against our rules or is just downright unreasonable. You want to say no with confidence because you're there to represent your organization. You're representing the library. You're representing your city. You're representing your branch, your team. You're not standing there alone alone. Um, and it's not about you and it's not about the patron. It's about the rules. It's about what they've asked for. It's about how our system works. It's about our operations. So when you say no, it's not a personal no, um, even though sometimes it feels like that. And we know that sometimes people are just, again, spoiling for that fight and wanting to make it a personal choice. It really isn't. And then one of the ways to um, make sure that you're clear about that is after simply saying no, if you say no, and then um, there isn't a pause or somebody launches right back in, you're going to respond with why you're, um, why you're saying no, what your rules are, and then you're going to need to um, go ahead and take a minute, step back, and remember that you are there representing, representing the library. It's not about you. It's not about them. When um, I've been confronted in some situations, um, after spending years working in a situation where I would often be the person called to come up after someone had been told no and then was unhappy about it, um, I can say too that it's easy to walk up and say, yes, I'm here um, from the management or I'm here to kind of untangle this um, situation. And I wanna say, if you're in the position where you are the second person who's coming up, there's another thing about no that's very important. I've been the person who said no and then had someone be unhappy and asked to see the manager. We've all seen that person. And then um, I've had that manager come out and say, oh no, we'll take care of it for you, no problem. Not only making me feel that I had been wrong to try to enforce the rules, but making it clear to the customer or patron we were talking to that I didn't have any, any uh, responsibility, any rights, any, um, any organizational force to say no. Now at our library in Scottsdale, we try to make sure that all of our staff feel like they are gonna be backed up by our management. And the management team has really gotten together and made sure that we're gonna rally and let our staff know that if they are on the front lines and they are asked a question and then someone is called out to back them up, we are gonna back them up and that's important. And it's just as hard to say no at that point if you're dealing with somebody who's out under the collar, it's the easy way to say, um, well, maybe there's something else we can do. But it's really important to be that person who backs someone up and doesn't, again, leave a colleague hanging. That's something that really builds your team trust and really makes it easier for everybody to manage every day, knowing that if they have a problem, they are gonna get some assistance. Um, so to quickly review, we've talked about one of the best things about knowing how to, knowing about saying no is knowing all of your rules and being able to say yes whenever you can. And then we've also talked about the fact that it's important not to say maybe and leave someone kind of in the lurch after you. Um, we've also talked about the fact that when you come up to help resolve a situation, you want to make sure that you're not making it difficult for the colleagues who, who's already had to deal with a patron who's having difficulty or causing a problem. We want to back up our teammates and we want to move forward with confidence. And some of the confidence, that's another thing we've talked about, comes from knowing that it's not a personal situation. It's a business situation. It's a, it's a job situation where you are representing your organization, you're representing your rules, and there's really nothing wrong about it. It's not mean. It's not unpleasant. It's just a matter of being able to confidently say, I'm sorry, that's not something we can do for you. Here's what we can do instead. Now, this we've talked about for a minute, when you do get that person who wants to see the manager, what do you do? Sometimes you know you're out on the desk and there isn't somebody that you could talk to. There isn't somebody to call, you're the person. So what are you gonna do? I have often been in that situation. Um, and it's just something, again, you have to take a breath, take a minute, 
there's nothing wrong with um, when somebody does demand to see your manager, <laughs> say, just a moment, I'll see if I can find someone for you. Step into the back, whether you know somebody's there or not, and just take a breath, count to 10. Remember again, your principles, I know my rules. I know that I am not going to make this a situation that's worse down the road by saying, maybe we can help you. And I know that um, I have my management to back me up and go back out and talk to somebody. And really, what is the, is the worst thing that can happen if you need to give a business card for the library director? You need to um, let your branch manager know that somebody was unhappy because you were trying to follow the rules. I can just about guarantee you um, that the branch manager or the library director or whoever you have to deal with above you is going to support you because you're already sticking to what they've asked you to say. It's not the worst thing in the world. It seems like a big conflict, but it really, really isn't. Then what else can go wrong? If you say no and somebody is unhappy with the service, um, we've all seen the Yelp reviews. We've all seen people come out and make public comment and you know be unhappy with things. We have uh, yellow comment cards at our library where people can um, go ahead and leave something and all of those get reviewed by our library board. And in the end, yes, somebody does have to um, talk to the library board, talk to the patron, try to resolve the situation. And again, the best thing that you can do is Say no with confidence because you know your rules, explain the reason that you um, have had to say no to someone, and then do your best to help let them know what you can do for them instead. Again, part of this is about depersonalizing the situation. And when somebody's angry and you know that you're doing the right thing, you've got the moral high ground. You don't have to worry about it. Um, I know this is ending up sounding like a pep talk, and this is what happens every time I get onto this discussion where people um, really, there's nothing tangible about why it's hard to um, have to tell someone something negative. But sometimes, you know, that's just one thing that you have to do. And it's not it's just the world isn't going to come to an end. I guess I don't know how else to say that. Um, even if you do have to talk to your branch manager and explain the situation, you've followed the rules, you've represented your organization, you've tried to do the right thing. That's why it's important to take that breath, make sure that you're not um, taking things personally, make sure that you don't escalate the situation by getting flustered or by perhaps resorting to name calling or something like that. I mean, it's rare, but sometimes these things happen where you just, you know, someone's on your last nerve. They're the, you know, you've had four hours on the desk. People have approached you with unreasonable questions. And finally that last person who's just out to get you, it seems very difficult, but I'm here to say it's better to just take a minute, say no, I can't do that for you. I'll be right back. And then you can go on to something else. Here's something else to think about. No matter who comes into your library, you want to be able to treat everybody fairly and equitably. And that's something that we've been talking about at our library quite a bit in the last couple of years. Our strategic plan includes diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're trying to increase accessibility and library services for all our patrons. So one of the things about saying no is that you have to say the same no to everyone. And this is tough. Sometimes you'll see somebody uh, that has, you know, she's a a woman who seems to be pleasant. She's got a cute little backpack. She's sitting in one of your easy chairs. She's taken off her shoes, curled up. She looks like she's studying. You hate to bother her. Um, so you kind of let that slide. The no shoes rule in the library is a big deal with us and probably is everywhere. Um, but that's just one example. So you've got your nice patron seems you know very familiar to you. She may come in regularly. You don't want to upset her. You don't want to say, I'm sorry, that's not something we do in the library. I'm going to need to ask you to put your shoes on. Contrast that with another situation. Sometimes you'll see somebody who looks a little rough around the edges. Maybe they they have bags and bags of personal possessions surrounding them. You have a feeling that maybe they're experiencing homelessness and you see them sitting in a study carol, kind of hunched over, reading a book, um, they're not really interacting with anyone any more than your patron who's curled up in the easy chair reading, but this person also has their shoes on. And a lot of times we seem to feel more comfortable saying no to that patron, saying, no, you can't go without your shoes in the library. We need to remember that it's really important to be equitable and to be fair. And 
this I can't stress it enough. It goes back to following the rules. If you know your rules and you know that nobody is supposed to take off their shoes in the library, you have to be just as prepared to go and talk to the nice woman reading a book in the easy chair and the homeless man or person surrounded by all of their possessions um, who has taken their shoes off too. And you know that you're probably gonna get more input from surrounding patrons for that second person who may look like they might not make other people in the library comfortable. You know that there may be other people in the library just looking for something that you can do to ask that person to leave or to tell them no and make them feel uncomfortable. But really the best thing about being aware that you need to say no the same way to everybody is that you know you're really supporting equity, you know you're supporting the vision of your library um, because you know we all know that for a lot of people, whether it's the woman who's studying in the easy chair or the person who's surrounded by their belongings in the study carol, um, the library may be that one safe place that they can go and feel comfortable, um, not so comfortable that they, um, that they can take their shoes off though. Um, now, one of my favorite logical arguments when I was studying philosophy was the slippery slope. You let one thing go and then suddenly it's an avalanche, everything's gone wrong. We're gonna hit on another important reason. Besides equity, we don't wanna start eroding our rules. We wanna make sure that we're really sticking to um, what our basic tenets of the library are. If you um, are somebody who is more able to kind of ignore part of the rules or um, you know let things slide, especially for patrons you know regulars or somebody who's giving you a problem or something, you know, there's just a lot of reasons why sometimes it's easier to just say, okay, I'm going to let this go. Um, you're really in that same situation, as I talked about before, with the downstream consequences. For one thing, you're setting the patron up to talk to somebody who next time is going to want to follow all the rules and doesn't understand why they're being told, no, no, that woman, Erin, she's let me do this 10 times before. I always get to borrow 35 books instead of 30. I don't know why you're giving me such a problem. Um, I want you to go and get her and make sure that she explains this to you. Um, those are the downstream consequences. And then the other thing is, well, I've always been allowed to borrow 35 books before. I don't see why I can't borrow 40. I think that we have to understand that you know, all of our rules are put in place for a reason. And we know this because we've looked at our rules and we understand what they're there for. Um, we can't go ahead and, and just each little, each little chink in the armor kind of erodes the whole problem. And that's, that's the issue with the slippery slope. First, you're letting people borrow an extra book and suddenly you're letting them keep them for six extra weeks. I mean, it doesn't sound like serious stuff, but once you condition people to not having to follow the rules, it's very difficult to get everyone back on the same page. It's again, it's hard on your team. If you're that one person that just feels so uncomfortable saying no, that you can't um, you know, be in line with everybody else and what you're doing. Uh, I find that to be, you know, that's a really difficult position to put your coworkers in. It's um, difficult for the patron too, because you know, the next person they see, they don't understand why they're being so mean and they're not doing what they want. Um, and we also know that we, we've put our rules in place for a reason. So you say you don't tell your nice patron in the easy chair to put her shoes back on. Suddenly, you know, maybe she's eating a sandwich. Maybe she's leaving trash. Maybe she doesn't feel like we're going to be observing any of the rules. And even though she's a nice person and doesn't want to bother anybody, well, it doesn't seem like we're enforcing the rules. So if she can keep her shoes off, why can't she do these other things in the library? So again, you want to maintain and make sure that you're not letting things get away. It's easy to um, manage when you are keeping things simple, sticking to the rules, being observant, explaining to people, it just makes it so much easier than having to try to bring people back after you've let things go. So I'm gonna go through a few of these things again, and I'm sure everybody's tired of hearing me say the same things, but I'm just gonna try to hit it one more time. Um, you wanna say yes when you can. Um, you wanna, one of these things that we didn't talk about, we tend to talk about the patrons who are difficult, but what we don't talk about is the 95 to 98% of people who actually are very reasonable. If they ask for something that you can't do, um, 
can you re uh, renew my library card for five more years? I know I'm going to be using it every day and I don't see why I should have to renew it in the meantime. And you say, oh, no, I can't do that. We really need to make sure we check addresses every year and know that um, patrons are still um, having the same contact information in case we need to send them a notice and things like that. Most people will say, oh, okay, that makes sense. And again, people are reasonable. And if you are reasonable to them and can explain to them what uh, you're doing and why you're doing it, that's a really important piece. Um, and we're again, knowing the rules, it, it really underlies everything. So when you're doing your orientations, when you're um, adding new people to your team, you wanna make sure that as you explain the rules to somebody, as you're telling them, here's what we do, you wanna tell them why we're doing it. That really helps things stick in people's head and it gives them that ammunition when they can say no confidently because they know why we won't do things. Um, and that's important. Why do we not let someone rent out a study room um, every day, uh, all day long while we're open? Well, it doesn't give everyone else a chance. We only have four study rooms, so we need to make sure we're being fair. And so that's why we let you rent for three hours at a time. And then if nobody needs that study room, we'll let you rent for another three hours. Also remember, it's not about you. Um, you're enforcing the rules, you are an, an agent of the library, let's say, and you're just trying to let people know, um, let everybody enjoy the library, let everybody um, follow the rules and do what needs to be done. You, you want to make sure you're not um, taking someone's attitude personally. You want to make sure that, say, if you've had a tough morning, you're not letting your attitude uh, color the way you're interacting with the person. Um, and that's hard to do that. I mean, talk about it. When you're a mom, certainly if you're not having a good day, no is going to be a lot more uh, ready to you than yes. Um, and that can happen when you're at work too. You know, you just had a tough time. You've been struggling with your computer. You can't get a program to work or you have been trying to finish something and you just keep getting called out to the desk. It's really easy to just not want to be nice. And, you know, we all have those days, but the more you can remember that that a uh, slice of life where you're at a service desk or dealing with patrons isn't about you. It's about the library and you're the representative of the library. It's easy to have that one step back and feel a lot more comfortable and confident with everything that you're going to be doing in those interactions, which is a backup to it's not mean to say no. We have our rules for reason you're going to be saying the same thing to everybody so you're not being unfair which is something that people often say when you say no about the rules there'll be people who say that's unfair uh well even if they think that you're not being unfair you're not being mean you're doing your job and that's an important piece of that confidence too and that's an important piece of knowing that um, if you call a colleague or you um, step back for a minute and come back and you know make everything clear um, you can use a polite voice you can even joke around a lot of times you know and it doesn't work for everybody, but I tend to lead with humor. Um, you can't really tell from this presentation, but uh, I tend to go go to humor first. And I know it can, I can be a little sarcastic, so I have to be careful. But a lot of times, sometimes if somebody will ask me something really outrageous, I'm I'm gonna laugh. Uh, and then when I recover a minute, I can say, "Gosh, you know, <laughs> gee, nobody's ever asked me that before." But no, I'm sorry. Here's what our policy is. Um, Sometimes a little levity lightens things up, but again, got to be careful um, not to uh, not to stray into sarcasm. And uh, you should just always remember, um, you're not being mean. You're just doing your job. Um, another important one that we talked about is that it's okay to take a minute and get some backup. And I actually, if you're able to physically step back from where you are, um, you know, even if there's no backup to go and get, I suggest saying, "Excuse me, I'm going to see if I can get someone else who can help us." Um, even if you know you're going to return and there isn't somebody who can help you, having that minute to just breathe, uh, you know, count to 10, whatever you need to do to kind of center yourself again and remember that this isn't about you, you're not being mean, you're just trying to enforce the rules. Um, and sometimes you can go and get back up. Sometimes if you do see somebody, um, you know, who isn't right with a patron or doing a task that they need to do, you can say, hey, could you come back up to the desk with me? I'm going to have to tell this patron that I absolutely cannot um, get this book for them that's checked out by tomorrow. Um, they say they want it. They say they needed to have it. Um, but every copy we have is checked out and we don't see another one for two weeks. Or 
this person came to get a culture pass because they knew it was going to be here because it said it was before the library opened. But when they came into the library at noon, two hours after it opened, culture pass wasn't there anymore. I'm going to have to tell them I'm not going to have another one for two days. Can you come and help me and kind of be my backup? Everybody knows that feeling of, you know, needing even just having one more person standing there um, anticipating that you're going to be reasonable can help simmer the situation down a little bit. And that's really important. Um, we've talked also about making sure you're not going to be making a lot of exceptions because um, when you make exceptions, they have downstream consequences. Um, that's that slippery slope we were talking about too. Um, if you decide you're going to let a rule slide today, then it's not uncommon that, you know, the next time a patron's in, they're going to expect that the that rule is going to be broken in the same way. And they're probably not going to be dealing with you and they're they're going to be actually rightfully upset because in a way, when you make an exception and you um, don't clearly tell a patron that it's an exception, um, you're setting them up for disappointment the next time they're there. If for some reason you do decide to make an exception and you feel there's a good reason for it, we want to always make sure that we let a patron know in no uncertain terms that we are not following the rules. We are making an exception. And if there's any way to note that, if you deal with the patron, you make an exception for them and you're able to note that in their record and say, I realize I could have said no, um, but I made this exception for this patron on this day because they had extenuating circumstances. And if you can connect your exception for a patron to extenuating circumstances, that will always help in the future. Yes, I see you've broken your wrist and you probably weren't able to drive over to the library two weeks ago when these books were due. So yes, we're gonna make an exception. We're gonna take them all back and we will make sure that you don't have any fines or fees associated with that. Um, it's. Exceptions are such a, you know, a tough call sometimes. Um, sometimes it's, that's a good time to, uh, you know, phone a friend, um, get somebody else's input on that, ask them what they might do. Sometimes people will have a good workaround that follows the rules, but actually maybe explains it to the patron in a different way or gives them some kind of um, way to understand um, why you're saying no or why you're gonna say yes just this one time because it's a specific situation. That note about exceptions also leads into our idea about consistency because consistency um, is what gives us equity. When we enforce the rules in the same way for everybody, um, we know we're being fair to everyone and that's really important. Um, I think that um, I have a really strong belief that um, we should all feel um, equal and that we should all uh, be fair as much as possible. And sometimes saying no is the fairest thing you can do. If you say no to everybody, um, you know you're not you're not putting anyone above the rules. You're not um, making exceptions. You're not um, doing something that's a favor for someone. Um, I understand we all need to have the power to sometimes. Um, know when you're, you don't want to be unreasonable on your end. And that's really the only time an exception comes into play. Um, but consistency and thinking about how to be consistent every time you deal with a patron or every time you deal with patrons in general is a really good way to um, feel comfortable saying no to people. Um, no has positive consequences. We've tried, I've tried to explain that as much as possible. No um, being fair and saying no um, helps out your coworkers. You're not setting them up for disappointment later. It um, enforces our rules and you know keeps our operations running because all our all of our rules have been put into place for a reason. Um, and it, it you know there's nothing really um, mean or unpleasant. You're just really trying to be fair um, and enforce the, the rules as much as possible. Um, you've already, you know, the first thing off the bat is you say yes whenever you can. So at the times that you have to say no, it's important to remember to be fair to everyone, say no in the same way to everyone. And then we also talked about the fact that, um, management is here to support you. And we talked about the fact that, um, you know, your management will back you up, especially if you can document the fact that you've been trying to follow the rules that have been set up. Um, and sometimes these people can be lifeline. Sometimes, you know, you're going to go into the back and it's not going to be your branch manager. It's not going to be your supervisor. It's going to be your coworker. And you're going to say, man, I've got this customer. They want me to do something that I'm not comfortable with. Um, they want me to take back 
um, a book that's clearly water damaged and um, not charge them any money because they've told me um, a story about the fact that they the book was that way when they checked it out. Um, I think we've all heard that one. the book was looked like this when I checked it out. And we all know that that isn't true. <laughs> So that's another time when if you have done everything you can, you've been fair, you've been consistent, you've explained why you can't take back damaged items um, when you know that they weren't checked out in a damaged condition, um, you've thought about any possible extenuating circumstances that might allow an exception that would be fair um, and equitable, and you still come down on the side of, I really can't do this, then go ahead and use that lifeline of management support. If the person is unhappy, and you know you're going to um, speak you know, to somebody who's above you in the hierarchy, your supervisor, your branch manager, you can let the, the patron know, you can let the customer know, okay, I am not in a position to uh, make an exception for you here. I can't guarantee that anyone can make an exception for you here, but if you're unhappy with my answer, I can contact my supervisor and let them um, talk to you about why we're not able to make an exception today. Um, or sometimes if you feel that that's a little too much and that you can't really get that out confidently, um, and it's a lot. I mean, I realize, especially if you are not used to customer service, it's not something you've always done. Sometimes it's hard to just be able to come up with that sentence that says, says what you mean, that says, no, I, I can't do this for you. Here's why. And then somebody still doesn't accept it. You feel like you've, you know, used all the arrows in your quiver. You really don't have anything else to say. And that's the time to remember that your management is there to support you. I've never met a library manager who doesn't understand what it's like to be at the desk and to be, you know, to be able to be supportive when somebody has really tried to do their best to help a customer and explain all of the reasons that they're asking for something that can't be taken care of. Um, Beyond that, remember that your um, your coworkers are there to support you if you're not hanging them out to dry, um, which you're not because you're not making unreasonable exceptions with downstream consequences. You're being fair to everybody. You're saying yes whenever you can. Um, remember that you're part of a team, that you're part of an organization. And this comes back again to the fact that it's not about you. It's about the fact that you work for the library. You're representing your city, your library, your team, your branch. A lot of that should be able to give you the feeling of confidence and the feeling that you're backed up. And sometimes that's really the most important thing when you need to say no, you need to feel that it's not just you out there alone with the person who's about to write a scathing comment card and tell someone that you haven't done your job right. We know that again, most people are reasonable. We see, you know, hundreds of people in the library in a given week and, you know, 99 of 100 are going to be pleasant. There's always that one person. And sometimes it's nothing you've done. Sometimes they're just unreasonable. <laughs> sometimes they're having a bad day. Um, as long as you're making sure that, you know, anything that's happening to you that day that might be making things difficult isn't causing you to be unfair, you can be comfortable. And that's what all of this is about today. It's about being comfortable and knowing that you can be the person who is kind of running the conversation. You need to think of yourself, you're the expert in this situation. Your patrons, while you're going to be respectful and while you're going to treat all of them in a fair and equal way, um, your patrons are not the experts on your system. You are. And that's what gives you the opportunity to say yes whenever you can. And that's what makes it so that you can say no confidently because you know what's supposed to be happening. You know why everything's supposed to be happening. And even if you're new to a system or new to a particular branch or a library, it's always, you know, everything that you know backs you up. All of the people that work with you back you up. And that's important to remember. Um, again, this is turns out to be much more of a pep talk than a, um, you know, a how to, um, but the more you can remember um, that you can be reasonable, you can be fair, it's not about you. You're here to follow the rules and promote the library and be fair and equitable and not leave your coworkers hanging. All of those things are important and all of those are positive reasons to say no. So this is my mantra, keep calm and follow the rules. Um, we all would love to be a rebel once in a while, and once in a while we are, but basically um, you are always backed up if you can look at, the, look at the rules and make sure you know 
why you're saying yes or no. Um, I have had uh, situations where I will be the next person to come in and I will say, wow, I don't know why the person felt like they had to be so you know, hard nosed on this, but you know what, I'm gonna back them up. They are following the rules. And that's the part that I really need to lead with and remember so that when I talk to a patron who might be upset because somebody else told them no, I need to remember that I'm gonna back up the first person they spoke to. And even if I might've had a different answer, I'm gonna stick with the rules because that's the best thing to do for everybody. Um, and I know that sounds you know, really, stuffy and nerdy and all of the things that you might want to say, but it is what gives you the foundation for being able to say yes when you can and no when you have to. And this is me. If you guys have questions, uh, and I'm sure you do, uh, like why did I think I could possibly give a webinar? Um, <laughs> please feel free. Thank you so much, Erin. We do have a few questions for you in the chat and folks, please feel free to continue submitting your questions. So first up, do you have any tips on how to open a dialogue between circulation staff and librarians to ensure librarians uphold the circulation policies? Yes, um, that's a really good question. And I think that um, I, Again, I don't necessarily come from a library school background. I had uh, went to law school and I did a lot of other things before I started to work in the library. But one of the things I was really grounded in, as you can tell, I'm a rule lover um, and I like to know what where things come from. I feel like um, circulation and um, information teams um, both understand the importance of following rules. Um, and I think a dialogue you might start with between those two teams um, would be along the lines of, um, hey, I, we're really getting hung out to dry here. A lot of my people are feeling like um, when we tell someone no, and then you go around us and say yes, or you don't, you make exceptions to the rules that people think will be made for them every time. You're really um, causing these, you know, kind of downstream consequences. So I would suggest that um, instead of, you know, suggesting a rumble in the parking lot after closing, um, you would say something like, you know, let's sit down, have a meeting. Um, I think food always makes everything better. Let everybody have something to drink and have a snack and then, you know, have someone from circulation who can maybe explain the problem in this way that um, if exceptions are made at one desk that aren't being made at another desk or, you um, you know, uh, the information team or the reference staff decides that they will ignore certain circulation policies, even though they've been put in place for a reason. Um, maybe if the circulation team starts with the idea that, you know, we're talking about our, our downstream consequences here. If you take back items that um, really can't be put back in the collection, that creates a workload for us. If you um, decide that you're going to let people, um, you know, slide on their fines or slide on their fees, and then uh, they're going to expect us to do that the next time they come in. And I think people can understand it from an interpersonal, you know, like if if I were in your shoes, I wouldn't want that to happen to me. And I think that's a good way to open up that dialogue. Let's say roles reversed. And we said um, that you could write somebody's term paper for them, even though we know that's not allowed. You wouldn't be very happy with us. So let's come to some common ground, understand what our most important rules are, and really try to concentrate on those. And then remember that, you know, following the rules brings equity, following the rules is fairness, and they're put in place to, for a reason. So if you can get some of that out in an uncharged setting, uh, like maybe not right behind the desk after somebody's made an exception, I think that could work. Thanks, Erin. Mm -hmm. Next question. Any tips about saying no to yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to overcommit with programs, extra work hours, et cetera. That's a really excellent question. And I, um, I am learning that. I have a coworker um, who has set me a very good example for that. And um, boundaries is important, right? And boundaries are just another kind of, you know, another brand of um, rules, right? So um, it's maybe it's a good way if you set yourself uh, some kind of rule and you think about, I won't be working on more than three programs at a time. And then somebody comes with that fourth program and it sounds exciting, but you know, you're already working on 
three. If you're somebody who thinks, wait, I've made myself a rule. There are downstream consequences. If I try to do too much, I have too much work on my plate. Um, people tend to take advantage of me because they think I'll take on anything. <laughs> then um, I think that really um, being firm with yourself is a really tough one. Um, but if you try to remember um, that there are benefits instead of, um, you know, trying to focus on how difficult it is to say no, or what you might be missing if you say no, um, if you can remember, the benefits. I can work much better on my three programs and do a really good job on those if I don't take on a fourth and fifth one. Um, if I try not to be on too many committees, I can really give my all to the ones that are important to me. So I think reminding yourself of the consequences and giving yourself the positive reasons why you might put those rules in place, you can follow kind of the same formula. Awesome advice. Thank you, Erin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And next question, what tips can you provide for those of us who are more introverted on the shy side and find it harder to approach patrons, um, example, to tell them they're not allowed to sleep in the library? Um, That's a big one. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, a lot like the no shoes rule, right? Um, I think that that's, again, um, and a lot of this for me is is kind of a mental um, you know, like a mental state or kind of a, um, an agreement with myself. Um, and I, despite the fact that I just talked for almost an hour, I, I'm not a big extrovert. And despite the fact that I tend to, you know, lead with humor, I'm not an extrovert. Um, but those are things that have helped me. Like if I can say, Hey, you know, you know, the rule is not to, uh, not to, you know, uh, be in the library without your shoes on or excuse me. Um, you know, it's real comfortable today, but we can't let you sleep here. Um, it's really hard to have to walk up and make those um, make those comments. And I mean, to me, and I don't know if this has happened to anybody else, I've had to have discussions with people who didn't smell good. And that's a really tough one to start. Um, and I really, I know how difficult that can be. Um, and sometimes you just really, um, even though I just talked about how important it is to separate yourself from um, these actions that you have to take when you say no, that's important. Remember, it's not you, um, you're just there to enforce the rules. You're just doing your job. So you need to have the confidence of that backup. You need to remember too, those, you know, kind of downstream consequences. If you don't tell the patron um, that they can't sleep, somebody else is going to have to. And even though that sounds really attractive, if you're introverted, um, I think it's important to remember that if you can just make that first step, you're going to feel a lot more empowered. Every time you have one of those interactions, you will feel better about, um, having the next one. Um, if, truly, even if it isn't a good interaction, and I've had some that are doozies, believe me, um, people who insist they're not sleeping, um, people who, you know, get up and walk to a different chair and go right back to sleep. Um, we know that part of what we need to do is keep track of some of these things so that if we do have to, say, ask somebody to leave for the day or um, have them have something like a welfare check, um, we need to be able to keep track. We need to kind of get a hold of the situation right away. So if you can remember that you're really helping yourself um, in a lot of ways by kind of making that one leap and saying, excuse me, um, I'm going to need to have you stay awake while you're in the library. And if you can think of a joke, you know, like, oh, you can't read with your eyes closed or, you know, something that you feel you can pull off. Sometimes that's helpful. And it does, you know, give you that chance to separate yourself from, you know, feeling like you're being mean or not. Um, you know, I would love to nap myself, but, you know, unfortunately, if we're in the library, we have to stay awake. Um, something like that. Um, it's been known to work. <laughs> And next question. Um, so what do you do if the rules of your organization are not very clear and enforcement is very sporadic and leans toward just do what the patron is asking? Um, I think that's a super dangerous situation for everybody um, on a lot of levels. Um, and I, I hope nobody's um, dealing with that environment. Um, I feel like um, in that case, it's important to maybe talk to somebody in management or at least talk to your own supervisor and let them know that you're uncomfortable with the vagueness of um, rules. I, I don't know about y'all, but I'm surrounded by people who question every comma, every syllable, every, you know, every possible you know, line of every single rule. Um, and it, with my job, I tend to sit in those uh, discussions about policy, but I, but I know that everybody around me from, um, you know, the pages to the assistants, to the branch managers, 
um, they all seem to have a really vested interest in knowing exactly what the rules mean. And the just the example that you gave made it so clear that if your rules are vague, um, you you can't enforce them and you they can't be meaningful. And that is, you know, just a really difficult situation to be in because whether it's about conduct, whether it's about materials, um, whether it's about, uh, you know, staying open. I mean, I've had cases where patrons didn't want to leave the library. Well, that's a really clear, bright line. And I think that sometimes, you know, someone's like, well, they're just getting, so, you know, two more things. We'll just wait for a couple of minutes. Um, no, I don't think that that's a healthy environment. And I don't think people really want their public services to be that way. I think there's a lot of security and um, comfort in, in knowing that there are rules and knowing that they're going to be enforced. And I think um, staff should certainly be able to feel comfortable asking their management for, um, you know, some kind of clear um, examples if they can't, you know, come up with something that's in the rule already. Um, if the rule is written poorly and it can't be rewritten, maybe we need to talk about a list of examples. What do you see as um, conduct that would call for being ejected from the library for a day? Um, sometimes it's not going to be as outrageous as you think. <laughs> sometimes just being, you know, annoying other patrons or, um, you know, trying to um, use equipment when there's a line or things like that. Um, it just seems to me that there are lots of possibilities for examples um, and the staffs that I've worked with um, are all very um, self policing about that kind of thing. They all like to know where they stand and good rules always let you know where you stand and that's what makes them easy to enforce. So I'm sorry if somebody's in that situation with vague rules. Well, speaking of outrageous examples, Mm -hmm. What's the most outrageous thing you've ever had to say no to? Um, well, I had a lot when I was in retail. Um, and, you know, I, like I said, I worked all kinds of, um, all kinds of jobs. I worked in clothing stores and bookstores, um, but I worked in um, CVS drugstores back East for a while. And I had a person who wanted to return an empty package of Skittles. I mean, there was one left, but they brought the package of Skittles back. Um, and said they wanted to return them because they um, didn't taste good. And I said, well, what happened to the rest of the Skittles? Oh, oh um, well, I tried them and they were bad. Um, and, you know, we're talking about, you know, a couple of dollars, right? Like it's just, it's a package of Skittles. But there was something about that that just seemed to be so outrageous. And it's so emblematic. I mean, when I worked in clothing stores, there were people would try to return things that were torn, that were stained. And they always fell back on that same one we hear at the library. Um, it was like this when I got it. Well, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, so I've had, I've had quite a few, um, but the Skittles one stuck with me for a number of years. I think that's still one of my favorites. So, and I did not give money back just so everybody knows. That's a good example <laughs> you're hearing. <laughs> So for folks looking to, for a little, you know, expand their knowledge on this topic, do you have any ideas for like further reading or other training on this um, you recommend? You know, that's a really good question. And I, I actually don't feel like this training was adequate. So I would love to be able to uh, report to something else. But I think a lot of this is about your attitude. So I think um, your attitude, your mindset, um, and just kind of your comfort level with what's going on. And I just, I guess I can't say it enough. The more you know what your rules say, um, the more you'd be comfortable. So I guess I would suggest for extended reading, um, maybe take a look at your codes of conduct, take a look at your policies and make sure you know what they say. Because sometimes you get used to doing things in a certain way, or you've learned something by shadowing people. And so you've picked up what the person, um, you know, who taught you does, and maybe it isn't exactly the rule. So it's really nice. I, um, worked on the um, Ask a Librarian team. Uh, when I first um, joined Scottsdale Public Library, there was an opening um, and I started working on that team. And one of the things that helped me learn the most about working in the library was reading the answers to the questions people asked. Um, it's all kinds of things about rules, policies, um, you know, questions they were unhappy with something that had happened and they wanted to explain it to somebody. And so for some reason they were going to ask a librarian, um, but there's a lot to learn there. And I think um, the more you can be open to picking up the reasons for your policies and the actual things that your policies say, does it say you can bring in um, 
you know, uh, a bag that's um, 36 by 24 and a bag that's 28 by 32? Or does it say you can bring in a bag that's 36 by 24 or a bag that's 28 by 32? Those things make your life easier. So for further reading, I would say take a look at your policies, take a look at your rules and be ready for whatever happens. Well, thank you so much, Erin, um, for your time today uh, and all of your wonderful answers to these questions. Thank you. And thank you all for being with us today. You will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this webinar. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Lauren.